We've had a good morning so far. And if you've been tracking with the uh, journey we've been on, you know that today is the last teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. Can you believe it? You're like, whatever. We, you know, like, is, is there anything else you'll talk about? We've been here for like a year, and all you do is this Jesus guy and something he said on a mountain years and years ago. I get it. I get it. So we're at the last, we're at the last teaching today. We're concluding, and where we're going from here is over the next two weeks, we're going to kind of take some ways, some creative ways to process and reflect on all that God's been telling us, teaching us, challenging us to do over the last two weeks. Um, next year, just going to be a little bit more personal and informal from me. I'm basically going to tell you not the most important lessons from the, te- the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to tell you how I've been processing the Sermon on the Mount, living in it, teaching it, studying it, hopefully changing as a result of it right along with you the last year. So I just want to share with you some things, almost testimonially, what's happened in me through this journey. And we're going to take some time at at the end of that next week to kind of pray as a church family. Pray together about what God would do for us and in us and in the season to come. Um, This has been a foundational teaching series for the life of our church. We're reorienting ourselves right here to build who we are and what we do right off of Jesus' words here. In two weeks, Ted Tansy's gonna come back with us. We're gonna have kind of a more therapeutic conversation about this because this isn't just meant to be information, but it's meant to do something that rewires our inner journey where we make some shifts on who we are and we become more whole people and we heal and the reality is I'm going to say once again today Jesus doesn't just give us the words he said do something with it but the greatest problem in that journey is ourselves (laughs) to do something we have to do that right in spite of and through ourselves. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna honor graduates this month. There's gonna be a men's breakfast um, next week. There's gonna be all kinds of things happening in the coming months. It's a really good season of church life. So stay connected, let's stay plugged in. And if you'll do me one final favor, would you stand as I read these last portion of Jesus's words from Matthew 7, beginning in verse 24. And Jesus says this, he says, therefore, it says, in light of this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, practice, keyword, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. End of Jesus' words, insert the voice of Matthew, the narrator of this biography, and he says this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. That is Jesus' final words. You can be seated. And um, I I just want to make another bold statement with you. Um, This is going to be out of right field, but I hate buffets. Anybody hate buffets? buffets as well. Can I get a witness on the buffet? Yes, thank you. Like crowds, kids, I have two, so I can say that. Germs, a thousand hands touching the, the same, the same oh, serving spoon, coughing, sneezing, everyone acting like the glass isn't see-through, so we have to peer up and around the see-through glass to look on the food. Like buffets gross me out, but the gross factor isn't the only reason, only reason I hate buffets. I also hate the game. Don't hate the player, I hate the game. I hate the game, I hate the rush. I hate the lurking and the prowling that buffets create, like when everyone's favorite dish or two runs out and then all these adults who have made this investment in this overpriced petri dish of mediocrity descend like a horde upon this oven-roasted glazed balsamic potatoes that everyone's all in on, like that's what they came there for, and then all of a sudden it comes out and everyone's like, I gotta get, like, it's, that's what it feels, it's like, it's like um, the walking dead in buffet fashion, I hate it, I hate the germs, I hate the game, Um, but more subtly, I hate buffets, because I get crippled by the amount of choices it presents to me. And I have a very spreadsheet mentality, and I'm like, if I paid this, 
and there are 128 options on the buffet, and I have this size of stomach and this much time, that presents a conundrum on the inside of me that says I must survey and I must decide and process which would be better. If you don't walk the entire buffet first, I can't go with you because you're going to be done by the time I've made my first plate. Um, I, don't, I hate the game. And germs, crowds, organized chaos, questionable organization, um, overwhelming choice, nightmare scenario for me. Is any, does anyone else resonate? Buffets, ooh, yucky, you can have them. Do not invite me to the grand reopening of Golden Chaos Corral. No, <laughs> thank you. Like... I don't like it. I don't like it. And I say all that to be funny and ha-ha, but also to present a unique question to you. Do you all ever get overwhelmed with the amount of choices that exist right in front of you? And thinking about where we've been and what Jesus has said again this week and the last two weeks in particular, have you or do you feel a bit overwhelmed with the choice that Jesus is actually saying, like, go in light of my teaching, in light of my words, now change. Now do something. Become something. No one gave us our two grand last week, so here we are again. That's a really funny inside joke if you've been around. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's talking about money already. Um, is it that one, JD? We'll see. Um, I'm going to trust the Lord for two minutes longer, but I'll, let's have it ready because he's good, but sometimes life happens. <laughs> um, so why? Why, why? why does this happen? Why is it interesting to say we've been on a journey and many of us recognize Jesus is super serious. Even we want to take him serious. We want to begin to change. We want to begin to put his teachings into practice. We even agree to that fact, but the reality is more often than not, our intentions are here and then our actions end up here. It's not just with serious Jesus teachings. It is life in general. Why is that? That a bunch of good people like us, like you, have good ideas, good intentions, and yet things te seem to stay the way they are. Can I answer that with five minutes of sociology? Is that okay? You don't have a choice. It's called a power play. Um, so I want to give you three, three ideas three from three key thinkers over the last decades. The first up is Buckminster Fuller, greatest name ever. Anybody recognize this? image? Any Disney people out here? Yeah, he's the architect who created the geodesic dome. Any Disney fans, he's your dude. He became a futurist in his well-known book, The Critical Path, and he came up with what he called the knowledge doubling curve. It's represented behind me. And in that, in that idea, he estimated that from the year of Jesus' birth, it took 1,500 years for all of what could be known to double. Does that make sense? For all of our awareness of all the knowledge that we know of, it took 1,500 years for that to double. Then from there, it took 250 years to double again. From there, it doubled every 100 years up until World War II, and after that, it doubled every 25 years until the 90s, where it doubled every 12 to 13 months. And now, this is crazy, most estimates put the number right about 12 hours. So hypothetically, if you were born tomorrow morning, by the time you went to bed, everything that we have access to that there is to be, that there is to be known would double. Yesterday, I Googled some of your all's names, myself included. Mine had 1.9 billion results in less than a second. Not a single thing was about me, but there was 1.9 billion results in less than a second. All that to say, thought number one, we have more information than ever before. Second thinker, second idea. His name is Thomas Friedman. He's an award-winning columnist from the New York Times and in his best-selling book a few years ago called Thank You for Being Late, I highly recommend, he writes about what he calls the age of acceleration. He says that everything that has sped up to this breakneck speed that we are living in, in particular, is due to technology. That makes total sense. But here's what's happening. And this graph from his work shows that technology is increasing faster than the human capacity to adapt to it. And he says that we actually can't change or adapt fast enough to keep up with this pace of change. And what that has created is an age of anxiety where at least a low level of anxiety is the norm for all of us. And here's what it feels like. Do you feel chronically behind the curve? 
chronically sprinting and running just to play catch up, stressed out and overtired and never getting ahead. Why? It's because of the pace of change. And here's the second thought. We feel overwhelmed by all of this information. We have more information than ever before. We feel overwhelmed by it. And final thinker and big idea is this guy, from this guy named Neil Postman. He's a cultural commentator and media critic from NYU. He wrote a book, another fascinating read, called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in it, he coined the phrase information to action ratio. In short, he says that starting with the telegraph, not what you'd think is Wi-Fi or the smartphone or the tablet, with the telegraph, all of a sudden news that, was, that used to be local and relational became instantaneous at a global level. And psychologically, what that does is now when you used to hear local news like Joe's barn is on fire, you grabbed your bucket and went to help put the fire out and you didn't say, oh, that's so sad. Let's start a hashtag movement or let's implore our Congress people to do more to overs oversight of barn construction. It was, no, that's my neighbor. It's across town. I grab my bucket and go. Since then, we have all this information and psychologically what has happened is we no longer feel that we can do something about anything, even the things close to us. And so what happens, more information, overwhelming information, and then we do nothing with it. This isn't religious talk. This isn't Christian. This isn't Jesus guilt tripping. This is sociology. It's the reality of where we exist. And so the information to action ratio is gone, is so low. And it's the phrase in one ear and out the other. That's the reality. So we have more information. We're overwhelmed by the information. And third, we're used to hearing information and then doing nothing about it. He's just staring at me. He, we're used to hearing information and then doing nothing about it. Sociology lesson over. So let's think about it. And as you do so, let me ask you this. Do you think there's any possibility that that reality and those three statements is intersecting with what we do and how we reflect and how we process a year's worth of Jesus's teaching from the Sermon on the Mount that I am saying is Jesus's vision for life in the kingdom that will bring you life to the fullest sense. Do you think any of that is possibly at play? And that is not a religious guilt trip, that is sociologically scientific, that is data driven. The reality is we are used to hearing things, being overwhelmed by them, living with a low level of anxiety and then doing nothing about it. And it doesn't make you bad people and it doesn't make me harsh or critical or angry at you. It makes me say, let's name it. So that as we process this and we become the kinds of people that are what Jesus is describing in the Sermon on the Mount, know that there are some things that we need to name so that we move towards Jesus in an intentional and meaningful way. And I stand before you today as we wrap this up just asking you to consider that this teaching from Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, verses 7, that you could read every day for the rest of your life and never fully capture in your heart and in your mind is just too important for it to sit in front of us and be content with, ah, that's just the way things are. In one ear, out with the other. I like these other ideas of Jesus. This is a little much. It's too important. It's too important for you. It's too important for your family and for our community. And it is too important for our church family. So in light of that, let's keep drinking from the fire hydrant. Okay? Let's keep drinking from the fire hydrant and recognize that it may never quench our thirst. But we're still called to keep drinking and do something with it. So back to Jesus' teaching. Real quick, two thoughts from Jesus' final parable. It begins in verse 24 again, and he says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Every time I read that word, I get the image of Alan Iverson in his post-game um, press conference. We talk about practice, man. Does anyone resonate? Am I showing my age? And I like the NBA, whatever. We talk about practice, man. Like, yeah, we are. There's two of you that understand that reference. He says, he puts them into practice. In English, this is a phrase. In the Greek, it's a single word. Cool. What does that mean? 
it means that lost in translation is the idea that the root word for which in this moment it gets translated, puts into practice, is used 24 times throughout the Sermon on the Mount. This is a thread. This isn't just like at the end, you know what, let me be more intense and say do this or else. This is a thread that's weaved all the way through the Sermon on the Mount, 10 times in particular at the end. It's a thread. It's a running theme where Jesus is saying, it is not enough, and I love you, but it is not enough to hear all this information, to take notes, to try to get around it in your head. In the end, you need to put it into practice. Go out and do this. Become this. It means for us to, over time, work it into the base operating system of how and why you and we live our lives. And to drive this point home, Jesus tells one of the most familiar stories that Christian or non-Christian, kids' church or non-kids' church, you know this story. Were any of you old enough to see this story taught like with the old school flannel graph? Remember flannel graphs? Yeah, flannel was like the rage. Is it still the rage in fashion? I mean, I'm kind of wearing one. We're West Virginia, so I'm always behind. Um, but flannel, like this was, this was taught. And like you probably did a craft or maybe, maybe if you're super, super Christian, you know a kid's song with some motions to this one? Anybody? Okay, if you're nodding, that means your invitation to come lead us at his banqueting table about this song. Uh, no, I won't do that to you. Jesus is saying, anyone who does this is like a man or a woman who what? Builds his house on the rock. Or builds his house on the sand. The parable is about two home builders, one who is wise and one who is foolish. In essence, in a very nice way, Jesus is saying, hey, don't be stupid. <laughs> hey, don't ignore this. And again, for those of us that grew in church, grew up in church, I heard this flannel graft at me with love, but typically taught as like those who build on the rock are Christians and those who build on the sand are non-Christians. You have that experience, it was Christian or non-Christian. And, and I, would, I would argue to you that's not Jesus's point or his deepest point. Um, it's actually about two types of Christians. It's about the genuine. It's about those that believe and then make a deeper depth into knowing God and building their life on his teaching and in relationship to him. Um, it's not at the level of behavior. It's not at the level of casting a Christian against a Christian based on church attendance or singing or tithing or volunteering or reading your daily bread devotional. I'm all for all those things. It's actually about, hey, there's a deeper way behind these teachings that has to do with you remapping your entire life and your identity and your belief systems and your trust onto me and my way. In particular, these, this vision for life as I've given you in the Sermon on the Life Mount. And Jesus' first big point here, familiar point to us, maybe in a new way, a fresh way, is that in your life and mine, it is that which is unseen that actually defines everything. It's almost like that message has been on a repeat loop throughout this entire Sermon on the Mount. He's asking you, are you living intentionally in the direction of my teachings and me, my, me, the person? Or are you distracted by the things above the surface? Or have you blended it too much with the way of the valley compared to the way of Jesus, which isn't a knock on the good of our valley. It is a knock on the commitment that Jesus is getting deeper into. And I ask you, like, why, why does that even, why does that matter? We kind of get the, if we kind of get the, the optics right, kind of get the behavior decent, we kind of get what's visible, okay? Why does it, why does it even matter? And notice that Jesus doesn't define goodness badness or perfection, the reason he points to why it matters to build and architect and design and orient and structure your life on him and his teachings, particularly these from the Sermon on the Mount, is because when the rains come and the flood comes and the winds blow, which is a really poetic way to say when life gets really hard and hardships come, you have something that will sustain you in the hardships of life. It's actually his love. 
that is saying, build your life on me. Why? Because I'm going to be really honest with you. And I'm brutally honest as a teacher, in my opinion, Jesus is. Like, life is coming. (laughs) It has come or it will come. And it has a way of exposing what's underneath. Not 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 just in a moral way or a good or bad. Actually in a way that says, life is coming. And I care about you enough to say, build it on the thing that will get you through. He doesn't say if hardships will come. He says when they will come. And I love, I don't know if you like this about Jesus. I like it. I'm, in fact, it's one of the reasons that I find him so compelling as a teacher is he's actually pretty honest. He's actually pretty honest. And what's he being honest about here? He's being honest about the fact that you can build your life on me or not. You can practice my way. You can practice any other way. But life is still coming for you. Hardships are still coming. And I find that refreshing. And honestly, follower of Jesus or not, isn't that just true? Doesn't that ring true to your experience and the people that you care about? And I love this fact, too, that Jesus is so honest that what he's telling you, what he's telling us, is that his way doesn't just like promise to lead you out and away from the hardships of life. It's not that. It's not a like, you follow me, nothing bad happens to you. It's quite the opposite. It's you follow me, life is coming for you because that's life. And now I have a way to get you through it. Jesus, I said it a few weeks ago, and his way makes suffering sufferable. And I hate to bring that sort of bad news to you, Um, But I don't think it's alarming because you are human and you exist and you know that reality. I appreciate Jesus's honesty. The reality is that when life comes to you, at you, in your direction, positively or negatively, let's talk negative for a second. It has a way of pressing you down into the core of who you actually are and revealing what was there all along. It has its way of wringing the sponge of your life, and there's no denying what's in that sponge at that point. It can be nice, or it can be, uh, what's the word that I used to think was cute but not? Frumpy. It can be, it can be nice or frumpy. Never comp- Guys, sidebar, never compliment your wife on one of those like casual but you look cute days and use the word frumpy. <laughs> That's what I thought it meant. Defining terms is incredibly important. Um, you do not look frumpy. You look the opposite of frumpy. Yay, God. Um, so, like, Jesus is brutally honest, and it has this way of exposing you. And life tends not to be cataclysmic moment that came out of nowhere. Life tends to unravel slowly, and the things that we are and the character that we're forming along the way and the relationships we have has its way of just, over time, exposing themselves. And not in an alarmist or a judge or harsh or mean-spirited way. I'm just saying that that's the reality. That, that's how... That's how life works. Life eventually catches up to us. And there's always something unseen that defines everything. Wise and foolish. Rock and sand. With great Jesus gentleness, he's saying, hey, because I love you, don't be dumb. (laughs) Don't be dumb. What's dumb in this is like, build it, build it on me. Build your life on my teachings. Don't be dumb. Because, because life is coming. And I care about you. And I'm not just spitting information at you. There's something deeper that's happening in my teaching. And so it begs the question for me. Like, this is the end. Like, so for me, there's like this, there's this transparent moment of like, this is great. This is like a year's worth of teaching. This has been our world in this dynamic for for a year. And I could say Jesus wants you to do something with it. But what does he actually want you to do with it? Like, what's your next step? And what's my next step? And what's our church's next step? And and as I've thought about that this week, and I'm trying to process it, it's maybe confront a question that's like, okay, but why this warning of everything that Jesus could have said? Like, he didn't do any of the good communication tactics, right? He didn't, like, finish with an acronym. Like, here's three happy, healthy steps for how to become more like me in the days to come. Here's seven steps to, like, reinvigorize your marriage. He, he, didn't, he didn't do any of that. He didn't get all touchy-feely with a nice story. He didn't, like, get all shocking 
he didn't end with all the sort of communication techniques that you would do to land a plane. He actually gives a warning. He says, build on me or not, and life will be different. So why this warning? And here's what's in my heart about it. I think that this warning is what Jesus does because it's meant to wake us up. It's meant to jar us. It's meant to break us out of indifference and apathy. Like it's meant to get us asking hard and probing questions with our entire lives. It should get us to ask the fundamental question. Am I intentionally building my life around practicing the way of Jesus from belief to actually knowing him, from belief to knowing him. And as we wake up to ourselves and as we navigate all this information and as we get honest about the complexity of the information age and the constriction and crippling it can bring, we have to confront that humanity in us. We have to. And so at the end of the day, and in our final moments of interacting with this year-long journey in the Sermon on the Mount, the question is, what do you do with all this information from Jesus? What do you do with it? Who do you become because of it? How do you respond? How do you become this kind of person? And for us, as a church family, it's the same question. How do we structure our church life together to be about becoming these kinds of people? How do we do that? Can I talk about that for a few minutes? And, and let me just alarmingly say, I don't know what the word is, like, let me just say, like, you don't need more information. I don't need more information. And it hurts my teaching heart to say that because I love bringing you information and five minutes of sociology. I love it. But you don't need more information. You have heard in the last year, almost from Jesus, in a certain way, all you ever need to know about what it means to know him and practice his way. You've, you've heard it all. But information is never enough. Information just exists. And information without gravity to the human soul and gravity that orients to the human heart and our thinking and becomes part of our body and what we do and how we think, it's just information. You and I need something that's wrapped up in a single word, transformation. We don't need more information. We have enough. We need transformation. And here's what I mean. I don't know if you can tell as a church, like, I don't know if you can sense it, but change is coming. Do you feel that? Do you feel that undercurrent of change coming? Some are like, yes. Others are like, ooh, help us. Like, we're already changing. We're already changing. God is changing us, and he's raising the bar, and he's asking more, and he's asking different, and he's asking us to rethink and consider. And, and you guys are great. You're asking fantastic questions. You're asking great questions. You're organically connecting uh, more and more without much of a system or structure built at all to help you do that yet. Um, we're walking, you're walking the journey of apprenticeship in honest and vulnerable ways. You are finding healing and growth. God is still changing lives in ways that are immeasurable. Change is happening and change is coming. And this summer is going to intentionally be about a few things. It's going to be about deepening our relationships one with another and leaning into community and connection and fun. But it's also going to be about mapping this inner journey that each of us exists with. It's one thing to hear Jesus' teaching, and then it's one thing for me on a Sunday morning at the end to say, we need transformation. And then there's this whole gap that is like the actual unseen interior part of our lives that are actually the problem. It's not the information, it's not the church structure, it's not volume, it's not the right songs, it's not better kids, and I love all those things, but it is actually about the internal journey that each of us needs to go on to confront our humanity, our brokenness, our darkest places, our optimism, our vulnerability to say, here I am, God, change me. 
reorient my personhood, my guts, my relationships, my body, my mind, my soul, all of it to you. And so this summer is going to be focused on increasing our level of self-awareness so that you can heal, so that you can become more whole in the way of Jesus. And not in a way that by August we expect you to check boxes, but only in a way that says, will you be vulnerable to God? Will you be vulnerable to each other? Will you be honest about who you are and your questions and your hurts and your habits and your brokenness so that you can express your need and in that need you will find God and in that you will find God's power to transform you? I'm not satisfied with us showing up and me giving nice teaching and us singing beautiful songs. Yea, God. What we're actually out is transformation in the heart, in the mind, in your family, in your relationships. And I would not name exactly what that looks like, but I would say it is mapped through you. It is mapped through your interior life. It is mapped through connecting dots that have never been connected and unconnecting some dots that are currently connected. It is through you. Change is coming. Change is coming at the visible level around here and change is coming at the invisible level. And you're going to learn, we're going to equip you to how to talk about and put language and handles to who we are and who we are becoming. We're going to give you doses of the future and we're going to give you words to attach to that and you're going to be excited about it. And you're looking at me like, what does this mean? Like, we're, like, we're going to change. And we're not trying to change for the sake of buzz or cool or fun or way to build a bigger crowd or modernize in those things only. We're changing so that people can change. We're changing so that you can change. And not just for change, for transformation. Because at the end of the day, if it's not that, it's just more information. It's more just showing up. It's more singing. It's more praying. It's more clapping. And I love those things. But it is not enough. And can I just say this to all the good church folk in the room? Knowing something... And believing something is not the same as doing it. It is not the same as being it. And even that is not the same as wanting to do it and become that. Like wanting out of who you are, that all of that gets expressed from the innermost part of who you are outwardly. Jesus' vision, as we've like gone deep on for the last year. It is not just a set of good teaching. It is not just a contrast ideology to the ideologies of the world. It is not just a set of ideas that you assent to. It is a way of life that is mind, body, soul, spirit, relationships, vocation, purpose, everything. It is closer to a sport than it is anything else. It's a rhythm, it's a routine, it's something that you practice and train and do in community on a team towards a shared goal and trajectory with your whole life for your whole life. At the end of the day, Jesus' point, Jesus' hope was not just for you to know more information, but for you to find transformation in knowing him. And listen, like, my goal, our team's goal, is to lead and pastor and build structures around here so that we can recenter this. That we can recenter change. But not for change's sake, for transformation's sake. We've centered lots of information. And I'm all in on information. I'm all in on teaching. I'm all in on all the things. But the end of of the road for information is meant to be transformation. The end of the road for community is meant to be transformation. The end of the road for teams and serving and house churches and small groups and name it what you want and business in the community and outreach and all these Christian buzzwords, the end of the road for that is meant to be lives being transformed by the power and in the name of the love of Jesus. And our role is to provide as many entrances into that journey as possible without prescribing it, without making harsh judgments along the way of in or out, good or bad, not moralizing it, 
so that we feel good about it, but so that we get down in the nitty gritty that can sit in a room with someone who may have the most profound doubts and hurts and questions, and you just sit and exist with them. And you love them. And the greatest gift that you give in that moment is actually your presence and your silence, not your information. Because your life, if it is being holistically transformed over the course of a lifetime, is already giving words to things that your tongue will never. We want to become these kinds of people. We want to recenter what it means to live a life of apprenticeship. Call that spiritual formation in the academic world. Call it discipleship in the church world. We want to recenter a lifelong journey of relational embodiment and experience to Jesus in community, learning from one another, empowered by his spirit. What you felt this morning was not better worship. It wasn't that I got the lights dialed in in just the right way. It wasn't that this room is tuned and more resonant in the key of A at 440 megahertz, which it is. It's not that like, it's not that the reverb was more powerful. It's that the spirit of God came in a way that met us in your profession of your need for his spirit. And the more that we say, I don't just need great teaching information. I need my whole life to transform form, the more it changes the dynamic of the room and worship that helps us to see past what we like and don't like, how it sounds and doesn't sound, why don't they sing this, into an encounter that is intentional to meet the living God because the primary concern of our heart is to know him and be changed by him and to remap our identity from the inside out on who he says you are. And it will take learning, it will take rethinking, it will take, it will take all the things. And it's not an individual process, it will take one another, it will take relationship. That's what Jesus wants to do. We are in that process, I'm telling you, visibly and invisibly of reorienting our entire church from how we think to what we say to what we put priority to, to the practices we emphasize because what you practice with your life actually enshrines your priorities. We will talk about what we're going to center on and we are changing for the sake of transformation. Not just for you though, so let's not make this about us, but for the sake of the tens of thousands of people that we live and work and play with that are yet to live under the beautiful way of Jesus and his kingdom, experiencing his love and being just healed of their anxiety and worry and depression and their divorce and their singleness and all the things that are broken. And when we do that and when we get over ourselves in that process, all of a sudden, the gaps that exist in our community that work from the inside out and then get exposed through literal things like crime rates and CPS investigations and children in foster care and everything else that we look and we say lines of those are the bad people, we flock to that like a bunch of gluttons at the buffet when the roasted garlic potatoes ran out. We flock to the broken because we're actually about seeing our brokenness healed. And when that actually happens, we can't help. You can't help but to run to the dumpster fire that is someone else's life because God put yours out. So bring the dumpster fires in the room. Let's present them to God and let's let him heal us. And you expose your dumpster fire to each other because guess what? They already know it. You're not as clever as hiding it anyways. So let's just bring it into the open. Change, not for change sake, but for transformation sake. And let me say one final thought. I'm getting way off my notes. Change is coming. And I'll say it this way. The urgent need of your life is not another insight. It's not another insight. It's not another tweetable knowledge acceptance. It's not another like doctrine to get behind or rethink. The most urgent need for your life and for those of us that share this area, the most urgent need for your life is, life is not another insight. It is to trust what you already believe. 
Most of you already have the belief thing worked out. Most of you. Some of you don't, and I'm okay. I'm not, this is, wherever you are in the belief spectrum, that can be a spectrum. But for most of us in the valley, it's not a question of belief. It's a question of, do we trust the person that we say we already believe? That's the inner journey. That's what the summer's going about. You need to, we need to, I need to, in our church family together, and literally everything about it, I'm inviting you to walk the inner journey from belief to trust, to accepting ideas about God and diddling around with that and the theories and the doctrines and the theology, and this makes me feel secure or insecure about forever. Like, that's a great start there. It's all part of our journey. But I'm talking about that gap that exists between belief and a trust from belief to knowing God, not just knowing about God. Like, it's one thing to know the Bible and then it's one thing to know God. It's one thing to know about God and it's another thing to know God. At the heart of all this is to span the gap from belief to knowing. And some of you, maybe you need to be like, yeah, okay, I'm ready to believe this thing. Or I'm ready to like, self-acknowledge that maybe there's something to this thing. It is evident that I felt something today. That is God's love pulling you to himself, to invite you in community to a people that are attempting to journey with our whole selves, becoming our truest self because of what Jesus says we are. The way, too much, the, our way of belief stops short of the heart. And it stops short of how we express it with our whole lives. Belief is just buying into a theory. And I love talking about theories, I'm here for it. But what we're going for together is personally and vulnerably and experientially about trusting the person that many of you probably already believe. And so information or transformation, belief, or trust, solid rock or the sand? What are you going to do? Change is coming, change is coming. Would you stand? Jesus, we need you, we need your spirit, we need your power, we need your help. It's one thing to believe you, but it's another thing to love you and to want you. God, I pray that you, in gentle, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. In your gentleness and your love, would you prod us to take a baby step, a giant step? We can self-define that towards your heart today, towards your vision. May we begin, continue this journey of remapping our lives around what you have offered through the Sermon on the Mount. Help us not just to hear your teaching and try to go do it in our own willpower. I've tried to floss for many years, it never happens. This is more important, God. What you're after is us to join with you. You believe something deeper about our own humanity that says, I'm not gonna do this for you. You gave us desire, you gave us a will, you gave us affection, you gave us a sense of trajectory. Would you just help us to realign that towards you? Would you help us to become the type of community that embraces one another in that journey, doesn't create in or out mentality, that doesn't judge one another's hangups, but just says that's an opportunity for deeper relationship. That's a moment to express our vulnerability deeper to each other. God, would you help us to walk in wisdom and discernment about what you're doing, how we can structure things around here, would this be a collaborative effort, a round table experience filled with people that are praying and participating and remapping their lives and leading the way? Would you up our passion and our call and our commitment to what is on your heart for the sake of yes, us, but for the sake of every person that is around us that is yet to map themselves into your love? God, would you reveal to us who we actually are, which is your son or your daughter, would you help us to live our entire lives as an expression of who we are? God, would you heal, convict, change, transform? And would you help us, God? Would you just help us to become these people that are building our lives on the rock? 
so that when the life comes and the hardships come, what bubbles to the surface is you and your way. Thank you for seeing us through so many things and thank you for the future that is ahead of us. Would you bring us greater clarity and community and self-awareness, passion, and bring us together into a collective of people that are mobilized by your love and for your love, for the sake of the world. In your name we pray, amen, amen, amen.